Francisco, Scott, David, and I would like to welcome you to the 2022 Palm Sessions. Please see any of these sources for the additional videos listed here. Uh, with this note, you know, this, um, I don't have any uh, disclosures or a conflict of interest because all those cases have been done in a hospital. We all know that the supracondylar humerus fracture is very common in, as elbow, children, elbow fractures in children. And uh, many of them uh, may have been very simple, though simple or innocuous, have been always associated with complications if not adequately managed or observed. This is an example of one child which, who came to a hospital uh, with this sort of uh, injury immobilized. What all those we notice have a clinically careful assessment of how the finger observed, how the finger moves. So this one particular thing catches everything, you know, the median nerve or how does the hand moves, especially the, uh, uh, if it's going to be impartment compartment syndrome or it's going to be a sort of vascular injury where the fingers are might be numb and gradually they lose the finger motion. So this is one quick example, how does we need to focus on, on arrival of any supracondylar humerus fractures in the emergency room. Similarly, we also routinely advise all our residents to, uh, in order to uh, miss those pink pulseless uh, hand, we also ask them to put the uh, small uh, sort of pulse oximeter in the hand and could see the waves, whether to see whether it's vascular, completely vascular, or you don't have any abs I mean, pulse at all. Similarly, uh, during the time of uh, uh, arrival to the emergency room, in addition to the radiographs, we also insist them quickly, a quick sort of examination of three nerves, which is very essential. Uh, you know, making the thumbs up, which rules out the radial nerve injury, and the making an O, and also the uh, finger sign, which is also helpful in diagnosing or differentiating the nerve injury. A quick couple of these three things will help you to say that this is a simple fracture, may not be associated with neuro or neurovascular injury. Similarly, sometimes it will be very difficult for us, where the family, entire family will help us to find or will help us to diagnose the nerve injury. See, the family is around, the mother, her son, sorry, her brother and her father, all they're helping to find out whether this child has a nerve injury or not. The simple way of communicating things to the parents will make us easy in diagnosing the injury at the time of you know, arrival to the emergency department. And we all know that there are three classifications of suprafrontal humerus fracture and then uh, management of type one. Say for example, this is a child who came to us, this is thought of uh, X-ray radiograph, a type one fracture, very simple, can be managed with a, uh, a splint or a cast and then it needs to be observed subsequently to get this good functional outcome and a radi radiological union. But then there is a little bit of uh, you know, debates or uh, controversies happening in type two where the American Orthopedic Association recommends a close reduction and pinning for type two fractures. We are also biased because we come across a lot of type two uh, fractures. We close reduce them and then we send them home. We don't do pinning in all those cases. But then what happened subsequently during audit, we found that this is one child where we managed with close reduction and cast subsequently uh, had a cubitus virus deformity. And this was the deformity where the uh, HEW angle was more than 20 degree. We don't say that you do, do routinely recommend close reduction and pinning, but what we see is need to properly close reduce and then follow with x-rays radiograph. If necessary, I think you can go and pin those fractures. Type three are very crucial and vital for management, especially the involving periodic hand surgeons or the routine orthopedic surgeon who uh, deals with these injuries, because there's always a risk of, uh, you know, compartment syndrome or associated with neurovascular injuries, where uh, most of them are uh, amenable or most of them are having common consensus about a close reduction and internal fixation with a question of wire. Similarly, uh, depending upon the time, um, which time you should operate these displaced fractures. Uh, the British Orthopedic Association says that do not offer, I mean, do not operate in the nighttime unless, unless it's emergency or you need to have vascular repair. Uh, this is absolutely true. I think I agree with that. Many centers, they don't have the facility of vascular surgery, but being uh, in our center, being I being in, um, an orthopedic surgeon trained in hand and microsurgery, doing all vascular surgery, I take up all cases every time in any part of the day. It may be the time in the midnight or in the early morning, I don't mind timing, but then this does not hold good in many centers. Also, we know that if the patient had any neurovascular injury or neurovascular symptoms, there might be 8% chance of worsening of the symptoms. 
this one quick example who came to us a delayed scenario he had a fracture i mean fall uh, and then had a stress in a fracture but then it was not noticed in a sunday it was referred to us on monday the clinical um, you know signs of uh, bruise on the anterior middle aspect definitely says that it has a sort of a midi nerve involvement or plus or minus a vascular injury similarly if you could see a bruise on the anterior retinal side it might be also indicating of a radial nerve injury this is a what a clinical sign to say that this patient or this children uh, may have a neurovascular injury so what was done this was a re initial ready graphs could not be reduced because nobody was there in work on sunday monday uh, a practitioner uh, did a POP slab, and then on intraoperatively we found that the brachial artery had an endarterial thromb the thrombus at the level of the fracture, which was interposed. We could do uh, excision, and then this is what the uh, primary uh, result after the surgery. Of course, during the intraoperative uh, stage, we found that this is the state of the nerve. We anticipated because of the bruise that median nerve definitely would be damaged because of the impingement of the, the fracture fragment. Very simple uh, rule, all we know that is the posterolateral fragment, the distal fragment moving posterolaterally, the proximal fragment moving anteromedially, uh, impinges or damages the median nerve in addition to the brachial artery. So these are the fractures are prone for developing uh, median nerve and especially brachial artery injury. Can be injury, can be somewhere caught, be caught between the fractures or it can have a thrombus. These are different uh, scenarios we see in our practice. So similarly what happens post op uh, the child uh, hardly could uh, move the fingers, especially the median and the other nerve, because of the injury we anticipated. And then this was the immediate post-op, and this was the uh, radiographs at this time, and this was the moment. We also noted that there might be some skin problem because of the delay in presentation and the bruise which we noted on the anterior middle aspect of the elbow. Uh, two weeks post-op, and then this was the uh, moment at one, uh, one and a half months, where still he has a combined way of claw hand involvement of both median and also the ulnar nerve. And this is at the time of uh, one and a half months. Similarly, uh, but at the follow-up, the fracture united, and about two and a half months, we also noted that the median nerve started improving gradually. Uh, he went back to have this sort of good range of movement at the final follow-up. So the message is: these are all prone to develop a neurovascular injury, and then they are having a good prognosis in terms of uh, you know recovery similar to the end of the five month radiographs. So the other aspect is that the pink construct, many of the surgeons have a different op opinion. Many prefer to have a, a, a cross caver pin because they say it's my biomechanical strength and it uh, uh, also uh, eliminates the rotational or the torsional stress. Uh, but most of the authors, they do agree that there is a chance of getting ulnar nerve injured. If we don't do a mini open incision to, to prevent this ulnar nerve, irrespective of that, there are literature says that alano can be injured up to around 4%. On the contrary, surgeons also do uh, uh, believe that a three uh, lateral entry pin is biomechanically, biomechanically equal to the uh, cross K wire, and you can avoid the alano injury there. And it's also one of the recommendation for American orthopedic association. But then in the recently, uh, in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2021, there was a large systematic meta-analysis of randomized control study. They noted that, you know, the cross K wire, cross K wire is effective in maintaining the reduction, but then the lateral entry, it's very low uh, in maintaining the reduction, meaning to say that 16.5% uh, of patients, they have a loss of reduction, which obviously it's worrying. So uh, again, uh, having uh, spoken about the cross K wire construct, we also like to uh, give an example of how things have happened. Uh, this is a five-year-old boy who came two weeks uh, with this, uh, sort of injury, uh, swelling, uh, no movements in the finger. And this was the cross K wire uh, fixation of the child. But then once you do, uh, see this uh, movement, uh, hardly he could uh, move, he can move this uh, on the normal hand, but he had any movement uh, noted in the uh, right hand. It's tense and tender, the boy always cries. Uh, what to do, we have to think about a compartment, post reduction in compartment or a missed arterial injury developing a compartment and to observe, not to observe, to wait, two weeks is time, too long. So obviously we decided to intervene and found that it's uh, impending compartment syndrome. And what was more interesting is that the, the Alano was almost partially transfixed by the question of wire. This is a video which shows that Alano is partially uh, transfixed. So we did neuralize in this child. And then we do advances the K-wire, re-shuffle the K-wire 
and then in addition we found that the lateral entry was also uh, not good and then the, the radial nerve was also being impinged by this cushion of air this cushion of air so both the median uh, the ulnar and the radial nerve completely involved in this child they could do adequate deployment and then we also anticipated the wound it won't be that much good in the post operative similarly we put them on a nerve stimulation the child and this is what we started on therapy with a flex outer gastrin to get the finger flex going on and this was the uh, final x-ray we don't have you the x-ray what happened is not that is the uh, features of osteomyelitis start to develop in one month so we need to get admit them the children the ch with the child and then we found that this was a complete osteomyelitis involving almost almost the shaft of the entire humerus because of the infection which we anticipated um, luckily or fortunately we treated them with antibiotics alone settled with a non union but then this was the uh, final functional outcome in such a child where who had a cross to care things um, a wire the sort of infection and associated involvement of all three nerves and this was a final outcome we could get in these children uh, similarly i was mentioning about the nerve injury uh, we should anticipate if it's a probably a median uh, entry uh, and you know when there is a combination or definitely need a medial entry obviously surgeon should not hesitate to do a medial wire entry and should be careful in dealing with ulnar nerve especially making an entry point the one criteria which always holds a debate for a long time and still continues is the cool uh, you know cool pulseless hand it's very difficult to manage this is a child which i shown in the initial uh, picture uh, most of them agree if you have a cool pulseless hand uh, pale white with the fracture i think most of them should do a close reduction and assess still the hand is going to be cool pulseless i think that's the time where you need to intervene i have shown many of uh, one of a uh, case who where we intervene and found the reclative was severely injured and we could reconstruct that so the other entity is called as a pulseless pink and or a perfused but pulseless limb uh, of course these are the uh, cases where uh, they might have a vascular injury in approximately 14.3 uh, percent but then most of them most of them uh, they get uh, perfused once you reduce the fracture approximately around 72 percent of cases they get back the perfusion by uh, just a mere reduction of the fractures and do a close reduction and pinning uh, you know this this article by the scanner they also found that approximately the return of pulse took almost uh, uh, from 0 to 233 days in the series of uh, patients with pink and pulseless hand so this is a quick example like where the displaced fracture we could do a lateral pinning in this case we did not get, get the pulse in the time of admission after that immediately we could get the pulse and the fracture was reduced we we'll also we also do a simple test by putting the pulse oximeter intraoperatively and postoperatively we also watch the movement i i been taught by my my mentors that all supracondylar fractures even a simple type one should be admitted and observed at least for 6 to 12 hours if not for a day that's the motto of our hospital because these are things which we miss and we found it at late and then it's causing a permanent uh, disability in these children so this is the two year follow up and this is the uh, x-ray of child at the follow up uh, as i also mentioned about the nerve entrap and any in the initial slides uh, most of them are amenable uh, to recover we recover uh, if you could properly treat them adequately decompress them at time uh, there is a lack of uh, evidence uh, to say that when to intervene especially if it's a pinkless uh, and uh, pulseless uh, pink hand or a cool absent pulse white hand absolutely there is no strict uh, you know guidelines but then there are recommendations which says that even after close reduction if you get a sort of uh, absent pulse and white uh, paler hand you should go and intervene and do as per report uh, one such uh, final uh, few slides about how a remodeling happens in a, a supracondylar humerus fracture i always follow this line the anti humerus line in all my follow up cases where this is a child we did a close reduction and cushion away and then uh, there was there was a spur there was a spur there which means that there is some sort of rotational deformity which was not corrected in the post operatively and then this was the final range of movement at 2 years but then we could sequentially follow and noted that this anterior humeral line was of course in the anterior third we need to say that she might have a hyper, sort of hyper extension deformity at the elbow with a limited uh, range of movement but then it remodeled so beautifully that child almost had normal range of movement in the elbow Uh, with no uh, deformity rotational or torsional deformity so this is such a, a wonderful concept of remodeling nobody understand how this can be evaluated how this can be understood so 
to, to, to also uh, to finally conclude, ulnar palsy is more common. We are commonly seeing our centers being a tertiary care, especially involving the upper limb and the neurovascular surgeries. Uh, even the cross carers does have a role in causing this. But then, this is a child who has ulnar palsy. Do recur over a period of time. We could observe them and then follow them till uh, they fracture, heal, and also remove the. So, thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope to have a lot of discussions and questions in this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Terence. Excellent talk. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, as Scott Cousin did, he told me. <laughs> so <clears throat> I have a, a very general question. So in my, <clears throat> in my environment, it's thought that every orthopedic surgeon, surgeon should be able to operate a uh, supracondylar fracture. For me, it's a fr frequent injury, but for me, it's not an easy injury because you can find from a very easy situation to a very complicated situation. So what do you think about who, who should treat these injuries? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, you know very vital question. I think uh, it's very difficult to answer in one <laughs> sentence or one explanation. Uh, there have been a mixed sort of uh, treating personalities in especially the supracondylar humerus. I'll take my example. Uh, I, being an orthopedic surgeon, trained under a plastic surgeon for all doing hand microsurgery and vascular surgery. Uh, in my center, it's a one all under one roof. Uh, any vascular injury, any fracture fixation, anything, I'll do it and then I cover it with a free flap or, or, or I'll do a microvascular nerve repair or nerve uh, reconstruction. I don't expect this to be in uh, all parts of the world. Scenarios are changing, scenarios are different, especially uh, even in our parts of India, there are certain centers where they don't have a vascular surgeon to come and have a look over it. I think uh, to be on the safety side, I prefer the orthopedic surgeons to treat the fractures. Uh, in addition to that, if they have a training of vascular injury repair, I think that would be more suffice in treating the supracondylar fractures. I will not be fully answered to a question, but probably the moderators, the Scott or Dan can throw light on this. Thank you. Uh any, any trick for medial pinning in the in in the case that you use it? Any trick? Any tricks? Technical tricks? Seriously, uh, uh, truly, I I I, I tried uh, many techniques of doing many open uh, incision and landing up the cushion away. Uh, it's not going to be that uh, simple rule of do or uh, simple technique. I think uh, many of the time I landed up. You know, isolating the medial nerve and putting the cushion away. In the recent time, to stop doing middle uh, entry unless there's a cross combination, I prefer a lateral entry wires. You prefer what? Sorry. Lateral lateral entry three pins. Okay. Yeah. So do I. As, as Scott, you you also prefer lateral pinning, right? But when you are, if you decide to put a medial one, any any trick to put to put a medial one pin. I think the only technical pro would be that you put in the lateral pins first, then you extend the elbow to make sure the ulnar nerve drops posterior. And Dan and I often, we'll, we dissect down, we'll use like an angiocath as a, a protector of the wire. So that goes onto the bone first, and then the wire goes through the angiocath, like a 16 gauge angiocath. That's nice. We, we checked the ulnar nerve with ultrasound, and we saw that uh, after flexion more than 90 degrees the nerve got over the medial epicondyle it's like a physiological instability in in, in children okay um, yeah i agree I, for me I, I will make sure that i feel the ulnar nerve if i don't feel the ulnar nerve then i think we you need to open it and take a look but you should be able to feel that the nerve is not there um, and you should be able to feel where the nerve is so one more question, Terence. I think that uh, bibliography says that uh, hyperextension deformity does not remodel, but uh, I, I, I've seen remodeling uh, in, in, in children. I, I haven't studied my children, but I've seen remodeling of, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, or it, right. it's got uh, done, whatever, see. You're right. I mean, I've shown one of the cases of our remodeling uh, we are yet to analyze, uh, we have to understand how this remodeling happens. Uh, we know that the sagittal deformity uh, may not remodel or 
may not remodel to extent which we anticipate, um, especially the hyperextensive deformity. We are also working on that. Uh, it's still beyond our imagination. I think uh, Scott or Dan can throw a light on this. Uh, Scott, what do you think? I think it definitely remodels. I think it just takes longer because only 20% of the growth of the humerus occurs at the elbow. But I, I mean, Roger Cornwall has a, a fantastic example of, of remodeling. So I think it does, it just takes a long time sometimes for the anterior humeral line to bisect the capitellum. And I, I think we see a remodel, it just takes a while. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think one of the other problems that we don't talk about, um, we always look at anterior on the humerus, but there is such a thing as when you have an extension deformity at the distal humerus, you can close down the olecranon fossa and you get this, you, you get uh, what would seem to be a counterintuitive loss of extension, even though your elbow is, your fracture is in extension. So I think that's one thing that is not gonna remodel. Um, so we should look both in the front and the back. Another, another question that I have for you is, um, one thing that Scott and I have seen uh, in cases refer in, thankfully none of our cases is yet, is that um, you'll see not compartment syndrome, but you will see a vascular injury combined with a nerve injury lead to an ischemic contracture that is not related to compartment syndrome. I don't know if you have any experience with that, or I think that's something that's important for, um, for the audience to understand that distinction. Because you, can, you don't have to have a compartment syndrome to have an ischemic contracture. Thank you, thank you Don. I think it's one of the very important questions uh, we also had a publication in the uh, BMJ Journal of uh, World Journal of Plastic Surgery, where we also uh, analyzed the sort of ischemic and non-compartment sort of uh, injury in a pediatric couple, and especially following injuries. What we presume is that the delay in presentation in our series, we presume that the delay in presentation uh, with the vascular injury, uh, they are prone to develop some sort of vascular insult involving a portion of the muscle, can be uh, the long flexors, the flexor digital profundus, or the flip. And then those are the patients, they develop, they do develop a sort of infarct at the time of uh, delay or certain injury uh, and the treatment uh, delay. Those cases, they do develop contractures. But in our series, we also noted that uh, by doing an early intervention, um, doing a compartment release, or in addition to that excision of the infarct with or without neurolysis, we could get a good results in terms of outcome and uh, uh, the hand function. Um, I think I hope uh, I'll answer your question. Yeah. Can I, can, I, can I follow up on that? What, tell me, talk to me about the pulse ox. Like you use the pulse ox, but what's the cutoff? When do you pull the trigger and say that it's too low? Does it have to be normal coming to the other side or it can be 90? What, what's the cutoff for the pulse ox? Uh, you're right. I mean, this is, Talk to the resident. I, I see that if you don't get a pulse, uh, say 90 or less than 90, it's, it's, it's arbitrary. I don't have a scientific relevance to that. Just a simple technique or simple mathematic technique for residents to say that this child is having uh, absent pulse or a pulse with in hand. But more or less, I think I rely on the clinical examination, a quick um, a testing of O, thumbs up, and then finger. It always rules out neurological and uh, associated uh, vascular injury. It's, it's very difficult to be very scientific using of the pulse oximeter. The waves form, wave forms are definitely helpful to say that there is a catheter defect and some sort of the uh, post injury, the limb is viable because of these capillary defects. Nice. Uh, one question, one written question. Uh, what is your prefer approach in a fracture that you cannot reduce uh, closely by close me methods? Uh, I think it depends upon uh, a fracture which uh, has a neurovascular injury or does not have a neurovascular injury. Does not have a neurovascular injury, I prefer a posterior approach. If I have a neurovascular injury, I think I prefer an anteromedial approach. Medial? Okay. Yeah. Anteromedial, yeah. Right? Uh, me medial, you mean uh, longitudinal medial or? And, and, uh, uh, I can see, I can show the slides. Anteromedial is somewhere uh, you make along the uh, arm, it starts in yeah. somewhere here, and then curves around the 
at the crease, the elbow crease, and it comes forward, anterior medial, where you can reduce the fracture, you can see uh, all those vital structures there. It will be very helpful to do a cross care of kidney because medial approach alone will not uh, give you an approach to see the lateral uh, aspect of the fracture reduction. I think I prefer anterior medial approach. And Scott, what about, what about you? What do you prefer approach? I think, you're, I think you're muted, Scott. Yeah. Chasco keeps muting me. I'm getting a little bit paranoid. Uh, we <laughs> prefer some, some form of anterior medial approach. We don't have technical mean. posterior. Anterior medial, you mean anterior? Yes. Basically anterior. Okay. Basically anterior. That's correct. Hmm. Perfecto. So I think there uh, we are. I think there's one more question, Chesco, okay. about um, uh, where to say. Uh, so exploring the pink pulses hand, um, if the vessel is intact, but you think that there's a clot, what do you do? Um, do you use a Fogarty catheter to get the clot out or do you open the artery or cut it out? What do you do? Thank you very much. For the the artery is intact, but not working. Yeah. yeah. You're right. I mean, it depends upon who intervened. Uh, I have seen, uh, I've worked in many centers. <clears throat> I'll, I'll narrate uh, examples in a quick 30 seconds. Uh, I was working with the vascular surgery department uh, initially. Uh, they use a Fogarty to remove the pulse. But I don't think uh, uh, that was uh, sufficient because m a minor of the patients, they come back with sort of occlusion again. Uh, also, I worked with uh, reconstructive microsurgeon team. They do a uh, intersection and then they do uh, anastomosis primarily, or they put a reverse venous graft. The other aspect is that they just partially open the artery, remove that, and then they suture it back. I mean, it all depends upon which unit you work. I prefer uh, excision of the thrombus, either end to end or I put a reverse uh, surface graft. Mostly, I prefer end to end. If you can get it. Uh, most of the time I get it because you flex the elbow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Terence. Thank you for watching. For more videos like this, please see our YouTube channel, Little Arms, as well as our webpage, www.littlearms.org.